Hello, I'm Keith Frankish. Welcome to the fifth lecture in this course on the illusionist view of consciousness. This lecture is called The Varieties of Illusionism. Just to remind you where we are, I started by introducing the illusionist option, the illusionist approach to consciousness, which involves denying that consciousness involves acquaintance with mental qualities, qualia, uh, phenomenal properties, phenomenality. Uh, then in the next two lectures I, I outlined the, the case for taking this view first, begin, uh, beginning in lecture two with the making the case against the realist alternative, the, the view that consciousness does involve acquaintance with mental qualities, and then in the lecture three, building some uh, outlining some positive arguments for taking an illusionist approach. Then in last week's lecture, we looked at some objections to illusionism, and I sketched the illusionist's replies to those objections. So with those four lectures, we've um, really built the, um, the case for uh, illusionism. I hope that I persuaded you at least that illusionism is worth taking seriously, um, that it is a... a, a worthwhile approach to, to the problem of consciousness, and uh, that it has the potential to provide um, a satisfactory theory. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to go a little bit uh, deeper into, the, uh, into illusionism uh, and look at some, some questions for, for an illusionist and some different ways of developing an illusionist theory. And in, in the course of this, I'll, I'll be mentioning a number of questions that are, that uh, illusionist theorists uh, face, uh, questions that um, have been relatively little explored so far and, uh, uh, and are ripe for, for further investigation. So if, illusion, if these lectures have uh, inspired you to take an interest in illusionism, then, uh, then this lecture may, may uh, give you, give, offer you some suggestions as to how you can pursue that interest and uh, some possible leads, some leads for possible future um, uh, research work in the area. Well, uh, I hope you may anyway. Okay, so uh, the first thing to say is that illusionism, as I've introduced it here, is not a detailed theory of consciousness. It's more a framework theory, an outline of the uh, an outline of a theory, a sketch uh, of the general shape of a theory of consciousness. Uh, and, there are many, and there are many ways of filling in that outline. In fact, fundamentally, what illusionism offers is a new conception of the explanatory target, of what it is that we should be trying to explain. Uh, illusionism recommends rejecting the uh, more traditional uh, conception of consciousness as phenomenality, um, the phenomenal conception of consciousness, the conception of consciousness as involving acquaintance with mental qualities, qualia, phenomena, properties, and so on. It rec illusionism recommends rejecting that conception of consciousness, uh, not trying, not embarking on the project of trying to explain what qualia are and how they fit into the, to the natural world. Instead, it recommends a different conception of what consciousness is, a functional conception of consciousness, a conception of consciousness that is more dynamic, in which having a conscious experience isn't a matter of uh, acquaintance with some uh, intrinsic feel, um, but is... Uh, um, but it's a matter of being in some, uh, some complex relationship with one's environment, relationship of sensitivity on the one hand and of uh, reaction on the, on the other. It involves being sensitive to features of one's environment and this uh, uh, sensitivity producing a complex range of psychological and behavioural and physiological reactions. Um, so... Um, and so that's what needs explaining, these sensitivities and these reactions and reactive and, and dispositions to react. Not some uh, uh, intrinsic feel. As far as the feel, as far as the phenomenality goes, all that needs to be explained are our judgments about it and our reports. Again, reactions. We Sometimes we react as if we have... Uh, 
um, a, a private world of, of phenomenal qualities, of phenomenal properties, and that needs explaining why we're inclined to 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 react as if we do. What it is about this uh, consciousness in this functional sense that caught, that 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 disposes us to to think these things about our inner lives and to make these reports that needs explaining. Um, uh, so we, we we need to. Uh, to take all the reports and, uh, and uh, reports and reactions as data, but we treat them. Uh, uh, we adopt the hetero phenomenological approach to them. We don't um, assume that they are true. Uh, we interpret them in the light of our theory of what consciousness really is, in the light of the functional theory of consciousness that the uh, the illusionist seeks to develop. Um, so those those reports may tell us a lot about what is really going on. We just don't treat them as providing a transparent window on some private inner world. So when it comes to talking about qualia and phenomenal properties, the only kind that the illusionist admits are, are what I call zero qualia, or I've also called them quasi-phenomenal properties. These aren't really qualia or phenomenal properties at all in the traditional sense. They are properties, uh, non-qualitative properties, physical properties of some kind, functional properties of some kind, that dispose us to judge that the experiences have real qualia, uh, real phenomenal properties. They're whatever it is that, uh, that, that um, uh, ex whatever properties it is that explain our phenomenal judgments and reports. But they're not uh, genuine qualia. They're not either classic qualia, qualia in the, in the strong sense of being intrinsic, ineffable, indescribable, uh, uh, subject, uh, completely private properties that are immediately known in introspection. They're not those, nor are they some watered down version of those. Okay, so being a little more specific, we, we could divide. Uh, uh, the illusionist program into three uh, sub projects, each of them very, um, uh, very broad ranging. Uh, first of all, there's there's a negative project, which is uh, making the case against phenomenal realism and uh, uh, advocating an, an illusionist approach in, uh, in the way I've been doing in these in these lectures. So this will involve arguing that that consciousness does not involve awareness of, of non-functional qualitative properties and um, refining and extending the arguments for that um, for that view the arguments that um, arguments we've looked at the ones on incoherence from the idea that we don't really have a coherent concept of qualia at all the the, the idea that that, um, that Dennett uh, argues for that when we when we uh, look at specific uh, problem cases we really don't know what to say uh, about our qualia cases like mr mr Klapgra, you remember um, and there are also arguments from anomalousness, from the fact that qualia don't seem to fit into our to our scientific picture of the world. Uh, arguments from redundancy that qualia don't seem to explain anything. Um, we looked at arguments of these kinds, uh, and there's still, I think, a lot of work to be done in developing, refining these arguments, and perhaps adding new ones. And then another another element of this. Um, this negative aspect of the of the illusionist uh, uh, program is to uh, propose a suitable conceptual revisions that are that are that are entailed by the by, by, by the illusionist approach. Obviously, there's the the central conceptual revision in how we think of consciousness, but that's going to involve, I think, a lot of um, uh, secondary uh, revisions. Uh, obviously, revisions to how we interpret, talk about what experience is like. What we say about uh, uh, our inner lives, how we how we talk about our inner lives, what we mean by this talk, uh, how we uh, think about our knowledge of other people's minds, and uh, some of this will um, we'll be discussing next week when we talk about uh, implications of illusionism that we might also involve some uh, adjustment to our ethical attitudes, perhaps. Um, and so, to, to to sum it up, this this involves uh, rejecting the heart problem and uh, uh, dealing with the consequences of that rejection. Okay, another project uh, uh, 
a more positive project this time, is providing an account of perceptual consciousness. Um, first order consciousness, consciousness uh, of the world. And here the question is not uh, how does, uh, how, do, how do our sensory systems produce mental qualities, qualia, rather it's how does the brain use sensory information to produce the range of reactions that are characteristic of consciousness. We, we ask what, what, what is it that, that, that conscious experience is doing and we uh, try to identify the mechanisms um, responsible, the, the, the brain process is responsible uh, for for uh, producing that range of reactions. Um, we also have to, I suppose, uh, give some account of what we consider to be the range of reactions uh, uh, characteristic of consciousness. Uh, it may be that there's no hard line here. Um, remember Dennett's comparison of consciousness to fame, fame in the brain. There's no hard line to being famous or, or not famous, but there are some people who are famous and some people who are not. And similarly, there are some um, uh, sensory, uh, uh, there are some pieces of sensory information that become conscious and some that don't. Um, but, and so we need to give some uh, account of what range of, of reactions we, we regard as characteristic of consciousness and how they're produced. Uh, this, however, is not a distinctively illusionist uh, project. Uh, after all, everyone accepts that the brain does produce these reactions. Um, the difference with phenomenal realists is that they think it also produces something else, this, this, this world of mental qualities. But for the illusionist, this is the, this is the central problem of, of perceptual consciousness. So illusionists all want to uh, contribute to this, to, this, uh, to this project, though it's not uh, a, 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 a distinctive part of the illusionist uh, programme. And uh, a little cautionary note here. Uh, I should say that throughout these lectures, I've assumed a representational framework for thinking about uh, perceptual consciousness. That is to say, I assume that uh, it involves constructing uh, representations and models of the world at a subpersonal level, uh, construction of representations and models by, by brain systems, and then the use of these representations of models by control systems within the brain uh, to, um, uh, uh, to guide our, uh, our responses to the world, our reactions to the world. That's a quite that's a common, uh, uh, a very widespread, uh, uh, widely used framework in in, in modern cognitive science, um, and of course there's an awful lot of work uh, involved in spelling out exactly what we mean by representation and what kind of representations that they, um, uh, are involved and how they get their content and so on. But these again are not specifically illusionist. Uh, uh, issues, they're issues uh, for cognitive science generally. And also it's important to stress that there are other non-representational frameworks for thinking about the processes that underlie uh, perceptual consciousness. Uh, for example, dynamical systems approaches, uh, which explain our, uh, which try to explain our sensitivities and reactions in terms that don't involve positing internal representational states. I won't go into this here, it's, it's got, it would take us too far away um, from our main topic, um, but it's important to stress that there are other approaches, non-representational approaches, uh, which are equally compatible with, with illusionism, I think. There's the, the, it's not that, you, that illusionism, uh, it's not that illusionism requires you to take uh, a representational approach. Illusionism is neutral as to the precise nature of the processes that support the sensitivities and reactive dispositions that uh, that constitute uh, perceptual consciousness. Okay, so that's just a, a, an important uh, qualification there. So all of this involves solving uh, what David Chalmers calls e easy problems, problems that can be characterized in broadly functional terms. And then thirdly, there is the more uh, distinctive, the distinctive positive element of the illusionist uh, program. This is the project of explaining the illusion of phenomenal consciousness. Illusionists don't just say, well, look, phenomenal consciousness is, is an illusion, forget about it. They say, well, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's not real, 
but it certainly in some sense seems to be real and we need to explain that and that's in itself an important and interesting fact about 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 human psychology so this in, involves providing an account of the introspective mechanisms that produce the illusion I'm, i've assumed here throughout that to explain the illusion we're going to have to posit some sort of introspective um, mechanism some kind of introspective monitoring of first order per perceptual consciousness it may be that you can get perhaps you can get an uh, uh, an illusionist theory without this this monitoring i don't know that's i think i, I i'm not i'm not stipulating that illusionist theory requires introspective monitoring um it just seems like the obvious uh approach for illusionists to take and it's the one i'm concentrating on um but maybe there are ways of developing uh illusionist theories that are entirely first order um that just in terms of the mechanisms of perceptual consciousness itself without introducing a further level of introspective monitoring introspective consciousness as i called it um and here there are going to be uh, many questions about this um these introspective mechanisms um uh what is the illusion based on what exactly is introspection monitoring i talked about the quasi phenomenal properties of experience the properties that um uh, lead us to judge that cause us to judge that experiences have phenomenal properties but what are these quasi phenomenal properties they're the ones that introspection is monitoring and somehow misrepresenting in a way that leads us to to think that our experiences have phenomenal properties well what are these properties what exactly is introspection monitoring what's the illusion based on um what representations are involved in introspection and how do they get their content remember i, I said last time that there, that there's a there's a uh, there appears to be a problem here for illusionists given that uh if this if this if the account of consciousness is going to involve representations of uh properties that don't exist then they're going to have to give some account of how these representations get their content how how do we or, or our brains um uh get to represent properties that aren't really there uh how rich is the illusion what, what what exactly is 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 the nature of this um of this introspective illusion uh, i'll explain what i mean by that um a little late uh, later in this lecture uh, how did the illusion arise uh why did it arise does it perform some function or is it just a side effect of uh introspective processes that that um evolved for other reasons for other purposes and so on there are many uh many questions here under this uh third uh uh aspect of the illusionist uh, program in some way this this third project involves um solving what i call the illusion problem the the problem of explaining the illusion of phenomenal consciousness which for the illusionist replaces the hard problem of explaining phenomenal consciousness itself okay so we uh we argue for reject for rejection of the hard problem we that's the first part we seek to solve the easy problems which aren't really so easy at all the easy problems of perceptual consciousness and we aim to solve the illusion problem of why phenomenal consciousness seems to exist and in in what sense it seems to exist and now this this third project this this third aspect of the illusionist program the uh distinctive positive aspect of the program trying to solve the illusionist problem this is in uh, in some ways the most the most exciting part of the of the program i think um there are lots of questions here um lots of different options for the illusionist theory uh most of which have been little explored um so there's uh, there's plenty of work to do here um if you're interested in illusionism uh so what I'll do in the rest of this lecture is look at some of the um uh, the questions that uh, uh that uh, that are raised by uh the illusion problem including the ones that I've that I've uh, just mentioned but, but but also some others uh I will uh mention some of the the possible answers to these to these questions but I I won't attempt to uh, evaluate the the different answers 
Uh, I'll just point to some different, uh, to some directions in which you might go, uh, and then I'll I'll leave it for you to um, to uh, to explore some of these options and, and see which you uh, which you think are most promising. Okay, so um, let's begin with the question that I um, uh, that I uh, mentioned above. What is the illusion based on? What is introspection actually monitoring? What are the features of experience that that produce the impression of phenomenality? Um, what is the basis uh, for the illusion? Okay, so let's begin with uh, an outline of the answer to the illusion to the illusion problem um, this may not be the, the only possible outline but, it, but it's it's a, it's a very broad outline and I think most theories are probably going to fit within this framework um, so it goes like this let's begin by make uh, by uh, making a distinction between uh, two things we, we might mean by uh, color terms um, and and terms for other qualities such as sounds and uh, tastes and smells and uh, pains and so on. Uh, take red. On the one hand, we have redness, and on the other, reddishness. Now, redness is a property of physical objects. It's a property of the the surface of the objects, uh, um, and it's a disposition of reflect. It's some sort of structure on the surface, which uh, 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 disposes the, the the object to reflect light of of certain wavelengths and to absorb other um, wavelengths. Uh, uh, this is this is a, a physical property science can tell us all about this. It's not particularly mysterious. It may be very complicated, but it's not. There's nothing particularly mysterious about it. Um, Sometimes this is called worldly red. It's it's red, uh, uh, the red that's out there in the world. Uh, reddishness, on the other hand, is the is the the mental quality of uh, 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 of of uh, seeing of seeing red. It's what it's like to see to see uh, red things. It's the um, it's the quality of redness. Uh, it sometimes uh, referred to as mental red. Okay, now, according to the illusionist, nothing is actually reddish. Uh, redness is perfectly real. Things out there are red. They have this disposition to reflect light of certain wavelengths. Reddishness, the mental quality of of uh, of uh, um, the mental quality of of experiencing redness, that is is not real, according to the uh, to the uh, illusionist. And the task of the illusionist is to explain why we think it's real. Okay, because it kind of seems that we're acquainted with this, with this, with this, uh, with mental red when we look at red things, and the task is to explain uh, why that is. That's the illusion that needs explaining, and the explanation goes something like this. So when we look at something red, the light that's reflected from it um, uh, is focused on the retina, uh, 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 the, the retinas of our eyes. Um, uh, they send signals to um, uh, the visual processing regions of our brains, uh, and they trigger complex uh, informational processes, which in turn trigger uh, uh, complex reactive processes. And all of this complex of informational and reactive processing constitutes uh, what we call a, a conscious experience of red in the perceptual functional sense. And so far we have a conscious experience of redness, but no sense of reddishness, of mental uh, of mental red. Uh, that it, what's responsible for that is uh, our mechanisms of introspective uh, monitoring and modeling. Introspection monitors some aspect of this complex perceptual process, some aspect of a, a perceptual consciousness and uh, creates a model of it and this model is used by other control systems within the brain where, so that we can uh, recognize our experiences, uh, uh, remember them, uh, tell other people about them uh, whether they were um, good ones or bad ones or whatever 
And that this introspective model misrepresents uh, experience in some ways. It's, it's not a wholly accurate model. It's simplified and uh, it's certainly going to be simplified, perhaps caricatured and distorted in some ways, that leads us to judge that the experience has a phenomenal uh, quality to it, leads us to judge that the, that the experience uh, has this uh, mental redness, reddishness. That's where reddishness uh, comes into the picture as the content of the judgment that our introspective model leads us to form. So on this view, reddishness is merely an intentional object. Uh, it doesn't exist. In reality, it exists only as the content of our uh, representations of our thoughts, just as Sherlock Holmes exists only as the content of the thoughts you form uh, when um, the thoughts you have when reading Conan Doyle's novels and stories. Um, so that's the outline of how the, um, the illusion is created. Um, as I said, it's perhaps not the, the, the only outline that could be given, but it's, 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 it's a fairly broad one to start with. And I think a lot of theories will, will uh, illusionist theories will um, uh, fit this general outline. Uh, but it also raises a lot of, of questions. And the first one I want to look at is this. I said that introspection m monitors and models some aspect of perceptual consciousness. But which aspect? Which aspects of perceptual consciousness are being, are being uh, monitored uh, and uh, generating the, the uh, illusion of phenomenality? Another way of putting that is to ask, uh, what are the quasi-phenomenal properties? You remember that I, I use the term quasi-phenomenal properties for the properties of experience, for the real properties of experience, uh, that are the basis for the illusion of phenomenality the properties that are, uh, that, are, that are actually being monitored by introspection and that get misrepresented in some way as, as phenomenal ones. So the question is, what is, what is quasi-reddishness? There, really, there isn't reddishness in there, but there is quasi-reddishness. There's something there that's being monitored and which is responsible for our forming the judgment uh, that, um, that uh, our experiences uh, are reddish. So there is quasi-reddishness. Okay. So... What aspect of perceptual consciousness is being monitored and uh, uh, what is this quasi-reddishness? Well, one answer would be that it's the, the perceptual states involved in uh, uh, perceptual consciousness. It's the, 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 the representational, informational side of experience. Um, the uh, states of the, of, the, of, the, of the visual processing system, say in the case of colour. Uh, so, uh, so quasi-reddishness then will be some physical property of the uh, vi the visual cortex. It will be uh, might be uh, certain patterns of neuron firing within the visual cortex. That's what's being its activity in the visual cortex that's being monitored and that's being and that's being modelled introspectively, and uh, that is uh, uh, causing the um, the judgment that the experience is reddish, so so yes, so quasi reddishness would be a, would be a, a, a neural perhaps uh, property or or a functionally functional property of the um, of the visual processing system. Now here's uh, another option: uh, attention. Here the idea is that uh, what introspection is modelling is not so much the uh, sensory processing itself as the control uh, of the direction of that sensory processing what what um, what we're um, what it is focused on that is to say it's monitoring the mechanisms of attention which direct uh, 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 sensory systems to to items of interest um, in the in this in the scene before us um, and this is an idea that has been developed by, um, in particular, by Michael Graziano and his colleagues. Um, it's they've developed a, uh, a very uh, detailed um, theory of uh, the modelling of attention and the uh, how it uh, explains 
our intuitions about phenomenal consciousness. They don't actually like, uh, Graziano and colleagues don't actually like the term illusionism, but uh, their theory is, 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 I think, thoroughly illusionist in spirit. Um, the idea is this, that uh, in order to control attention, we uh, attention is a, is a complex, many-faceted process. And in order to control it, we, or rather our brains, it's largely, uh, uh, the control is largely at a subpersonal level, um, uh, we need some uh, a simplified model of it, um, of, of how our attentional mechanisms are, are operating and where they're directed and so on. So the brain uh, monitors its own attentional processes and constructs a simplified model of them, which uh, Graziano calls an attention schema. And this represents uh, attention in a, uh, the attentional mechanisms in a, in a simplified form, or a caricatured form. Uh, um, it represents attention as a sort of mental essence uh, which can grasp information and uh, uh, have various effects on ourselves and on, on, the, uh, on the world. And that, this, is a, this is a caricature, but it's, it's sufficient for, the purpose, for control purposes. And it's this model of attention, this simplified model of attention as a sort of mental essence, that leads us to judge that our experiences have a, have a qualitative character. So that when we're uh, attending to, to something red, that there is a, a mental essence of redness uh, there. Uh, so, in this view, uh, quasi reddishness the the, the the features that are actually being being monitored will be will be structural features um, uh, relevant to relevant to the uh, features of experience uh, that are relevant to the control of attention aspects of the attentional uh, mechanisms and uh, here is a recent paper by uh, Graziano and colleagues in which they summarize their um, their uh, model which they hope will become a standard model of consciousness uh, which integrates other approaches, including illusionism. Uh, uh, and uh, the same journal has also published a range of commentaries on uh, on that um, paper, and uh, uh, Graziano and colleagues' uh, replies to the responses. So it's uh, it's it's a good place to start exploring this um, this approach. Okay, uh, let's move on to another approach. Uh, the suggestion here is that what introspection is monitoring is uh, not so much perception, not, not so much the informational side of experience, but the, the downstream side, the, the reactions, the downstream effects of uh, perception, the um, psychological reactions that um, perception evokes, the perceptual processes evoke the other side of the, of the, uh, of the uh, circle, if you like. Um, um, so, quasi reddishness the, the the features that are being uh, tracked will be um, will be something like the overall psychological impact that's made by perceptions of, of reddishness. The introspection will be monitoring the the pattern of reactions that are being the characteristic patterns of reaction uh, that uh, the the current um, stimulus is evoking. Uh, so, if 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 this is right, and and if and it is. Um, the modelling of these uh, pattern of reactions, a, a reaction schema, I've, I've called it, in uh, by analogy with Graziano, um, uh, Graziano's attention schema. So, um, uh, if this is what uh, introspection is modelling, and if this is what our judgments, uh, our phenomenal judgments, are actually sensitive to, then it would mean that our phenomenal judgments are really are expressing how worldly properties. Are affecting us. So, uh, what we're, what introspection is monitoring is the effect that red things have on us, the complex array of reactions that red things evoke in us, and that when we judge that an experience is reddish, we're actually responding to that um, complex array of reactions. Um, so insofar as reddishness is anything, reddishness in the qualitative sense doesn't exist, but when we talk about reddishness, what we're actually responding to is this complex array of, um, uh, of reactions, the effect of the, of the particular stimulus on us. So we might say that uh, uh, 
reddishness, judgments about reddishness are expressive of the impact that redness makes on us. And I think this is a, a very promising approach and it's one that um, that Daniel Dennett is also uh, sympathetic to. Here's a little uh, quotation from a, a 1993 paper of his in which he says this, what anchors a naive sense uh, that there are such properties of, as qualia, when he talks about anchoring here, of course, he's referring to the to what I call the quasi-phenomenal properties, the properties which are, are the uh, the basis for these judgments about qualia. What anchors on a naive sense that there are properties such as qualia are the that there are such properties as qualia are the multiple asymmetrical interdependent set of reactive dispositions by which we acquaint ourselves with the sensible world. Our sense that the color red has, as it were, an identity, a personality all of its own, is due to the host of different associations that go with each color, the associations that are evoked by, by the, um, the recognition of the color. If there were creatures lacking all such reactive landmarks in their dispositional makeup, they would not think they had qualia at all. What it was like to have one sort of experience would not differ at all from what it was like to have a different one. What then it's saying is that the, that, that the um, our sense of uh, uh, that there's a distinctive reddishness about our experience of red things that's distinct from the bluishness of experience of blue things and so on, uh, is due to the fact that red things evoke uh, a distinctive set of associations in us, um, associations and also and I guess all, all kinds of other reactions. Uh, but I think it has to be a little bit more than that. It's not just that they evoke this distinctive set of, of, of reactions, but that we are sensitive to this different set of reactions. We're aware of the patterns of reactive dispositions that different uh, stimuli, different colours maybe, uh, produce in us. And we can internally distinguish between different experiences on the basis of the patterns of reaction that they uh, that they generate that they in all that they involve and uh, those differences in reactions in reactive dispositions create the sense uh, that they each have a, a distinctive quality the quality is a sort of is a if you like a misrepresentation of the distinctive pattern of reactions so when we describe an experience as reddish, what we're, what we're actually uh, responding to is the distinctive significance that red things have for us, um, the distinctive psychological impact they make on us, and similarly for all other phenomenal properties. Um, okay, so I, I think that's a, a, um, an attractive, um, a particularly attractive proposal. Um, let me mention one more um, um, suggestion about what it is that introspection is tracking. Um, this is a proposal from uh, made by the psycholog psychologist Nicholas Humphrey, uh, and it's it can be seen as a, a, a development or uh, a variant of the previous suggestion because again it places um, response and significance at the at the centre of the story. But the idea here is that. Um, we have, a, we have a separate system for representing significance or expressing significance. Um, this involves making a distinction between perceptions, which are informational states, which uh, uh, carry information about the stimulus and uh, feed into cognitive processes, and uh, sensations, which are the, the states we think of as, as qualitative, as having a, a distinctive feel to them. And these two kinds of states, the informational perceptions and uh, qualitative sensations, have different functions. Perceptions represent stimuli, carry information about them, whereas sensations uh, are expressive responses to stimuli. Um, the um, uh, perceptions themselves will generate responses, but they will be of a cognitive kind. Uh, sentitions are more expressions of what the stimulus means for the organism, whether it's positive or negative, say, a uh, very simple level. Uh, um, Humphrey argues that uh, sensations arise from a, 
a very ancient system, evolutionarily ancient system that goes right back to very primitive forms of life. Originally, these responses were um, overt responses. They might be moving towards a, 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 a positive stimulus, as food, say, or retreating from a noxious one. And these actions expressed the significance of the stimulus for the organism, whether it was positive or negative. And Humphrey argues that uh, in the course of evolution, these uh, responses were, uh, as he puts it, privatized. That's to say, they, were, they, they no the, the signals um, initiating these responses were no longer sent to motor systems and that produce actual bodily movement. Rather, they were sent to an internal map of the of the uh, body in the brain. Uh, but they still carried this information about the significance of the stimulus. Uh, and Humphrey calls these, um, these, these, these active responses to um, stimuli, he calls them sentitions, which is a blend of uh, sensation and volition because they're active responses. It's quite a complex story and I encourage you to, um, to uh, follow it up for yourself. Let's get to the bottom line though. The bottom line here is that uh, what introspection is monitoring uh, 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 are these sentitions, these um, these in, these privatized responses to um, to stimuli, and thus quasi radishness is going to be uh, some property of these of these uh, sentition processes, perhaps a neural or functional property of them. Um, so. Uh, Quasi reddishness is some property of sentitions of red, and when those sentitions are monitored, that generates what we call a sensation, uh, uh, which is the state we're inclined to describe as uh, having a phenomenal character, character to it, as being reddish. So, so we have a sentition of red, which is uh, an evaluative response to redness, a measure of what significance redness has for us, our introspective model. Introspection uh, monitors that um, uh, features of that response, and that leads us to judge that our experience, that our sensation, uh, it has this uh, quality, this special quality. Of I should say that I've missed out quite a few steps in that story. Humphrey has uh, a theory about the nature of sentitions and how they've become. Um, sculpted by natural selection to create this impression of a magical non-physical inner world. Uh, he thinks that um, uh, that our sense of being phenomenally conscious of having this this, this private world of non-physical uh, qualitative properties is actually a, a, an adaptive one and that uh, evolution has sculpted the mechanisms of sentition precisely to create this uh, illusion. Like Graziano, Humphrey isn't too fond of the word illusion, the term illusionism, um, which he thinks has some uh, uh, unfortunate um, connotations, but his account is, is illusionist in the sense that I'm, uh, that I'm describing. Okay, so there are four possible answers to the question: well, What is uh, the illusion based on? What what is um, what is introspection tracking? What uh, is the basis for this sense we have that our that our um, uh, experiences have uh, uh, phenomenal properties? I don't think they're exclusive. It might be that introspection is monitoring more than one thing, um, and there may be other possibility, and there may be other possibilities too. But that's just to give you a sense of some of the of some of the options here. Okay, now let's move on now to. Oh, and uh, let let me there give you the reference to uh, Humphrey's book. It's called um, Soul Dust: The Magic of Consciousness, published in two thousand and eleven. It's um, it's a fascinating book, and I strongly recommend it. Okay, let's move on now to another question. I'm I've talking about introspection as uh, representing features of experience, modeling experience. Well, what sort of representations are involved here? Well, let's, let's simplify it a little bit. So we have 
so at the bottom, so at the bottom we have the experience with it, uh, with the properties that are actually being tracked, the real properties that are being tracked, the quasi reddishness as I've called them. We have the introspective model which represents uh, these features of experience, uh, and then we have the judge at the top, the judgment that the introspective model generates, the judgment that the experience is reddish has uh, a reddish uh, has a men has the property of mental redness. So that's a schematic version of the picture we've been looking at. And in this um, picture, there are two types of introspective mechanism, uh, introspective representations. There are the personal level phenomenal concepts that are employed in our introspective judgments and reports. Okay, so these are the concepts that we would express by saying, you know, uh, by having a reddish experience, an experience with a reddish feel. Um, and then there are also subpersonal introspective um, representations that are involved in the introspective model itself. Now these representations are subpersonal there. The model is constructed by uh, brain systems, not by us, and uh, the representational uh, language involved is, is not one that, uh, that we have any access to. It's some kind of... Uh, brain language. Some it's a representational system employed by um, uh, by the brain at a subpersonal level. But if we're if we work if we're assuming that um, if we're assuming a representational framework here, it's going to involve uh, representations uh, of features of experience, the features that it's tracking. Okay, so let's assume then that um, that we have these these two kinds of introspective representations. The, the personal phenomenal uh, personal level phenomenal concepts and uh, subpersonal um, introspective representations now the illusionist is going to have to say something uh, about the nature of these representations about how they get their content uh, have to provide a, a theory of content for them um, and this immediately uh, raises a problem that I that I mentioned last time uh, if these representations are include representations of phenomenal properties, representations of reddishness and other qualitative properties, then how do they get uh, get that content? How do uh, we get how do we come to have con concepts or subpersonal representations that represent things uh, that aren't really there? Now, in general, there's not too much of a problem about how how uh, how we can think about things that that don't exist. Uh, we can think about Father Christmas and unicorns and so on. Uh, but in most of these cases, uh, the thing we're thinking about is a compound of things that do exist. So, a unicorn is a, a horse with a uh, with a, a pink coloured horse, to say, with a spirally horn on its uh, nose. And so we, we have concepts for those elements and we just put them together. And similarly with Father Christmas, it's a, he's a fat jolly man who brings presents at Christmas and so on. And so we just construct this, uh, the concept of Father Christmas from the other concepts that we, we do have and which um, uh, do refer to, th to, to things. But when, we come, when it comes to phenomenal properties, that... Um, that doesn't that uh, approach doesn't seem to work because these properties seem to be simple and unstructured. Um, the uh, the feel of seeing red reddishness uh, it just seems to be a pure unstructured uh, quality. It's not composed of other elements. So we have a problem as to how we can represent reddishness, and it seems that that we do represent it at least in our our judgments. So this is what I call the phenomenal representation problem. Um, how do we or, or our brains represent properties uh, that aren't there? Uh, especially when they're of this simple, unstructured kind. Now in the case of personal level phenomenal concepts, this, this might not be too, diff too, too much of a problem. These concepts might be theoretical ones, that is to say ones that are introduced as part of a theory and get their meaning from the theory to which they belong. So we maybe we have this theory about uh, about about consciousness that it consists of acquaintance with private mental qualities that are intrinsic and ineffable and so on, and uh, 
we uh, think of reddishness as the private mental quality that's produced by seeing red things. So we, 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 we characterize uh, reddishness uh, by a description, by a theory of the nature of consciousness. And uh, we could uh, individuate different phenomenal concepts by the, by the stimuli that trigger them. So the private mental quality that's produced by seeing red, by tasting coffee, by, uh, 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 by bruising your shin, say, and so on. Um, but what about uh, the subpersonal uh, representations? If they include representations of, of phenomenal properties, then uh, how, how do they get their content? Um, are they innate representations? Do we have innate representations of phenomenal properties? Well, but this is uh, certainly a, a, a question that uh, illusionists need to address. Uh, the answer that they give will depend, though, to some extent, on the next question that I want to introduce, um, which is this: How rich is the how rich is the illusion of phenomenality? Now, according to the illusionist, the introspective model misrepresents its target. And we talked earlier about what its target might be, whether it's uh, aspects of uh, uh, sensory processing, perceptual, uh, perceptual processes, whether it's uh, the reactions that, um, that those processes uh, generate, or whether it's attentional mechanisms that direct sensory processing, and, um, and so on. But it's part of the illusion story that introspection misrepresents these features that it's tracking. Um, and that's how we come to form the judgment that um, uh, that we're um, acquainted with uh, mental qualities, with, with qualia. Um, but how exactly does introspection misrepresent its target? Well, it's distinguished two kinds of misrepresentation. One is negative. A negative um, misrepresentation fails to represent something that's there. So it, om it omits something, it misses something out, it's incomplete. Here's a photograph of an old sideshow exhibit that was, was popular in the, uh, I guess, in the, in the middle of the 20th century. It's, a, it's, um, it's supposed to be a headless woman. Okay? It's, it's a real live woman, uh, and it seems that she has this contraption of tubes and things uh, going into her neck instead of her head. Uh, and that's what you would appear to. That's what you would. Um, that's what you would see if you were if you were present at the at the sideshow. And what's ac what's actually happening here is that the woman is is in fact wearing a, a contraption of mirrors that reflect the pipes and make it look as if she does, and the the background and make it look as if she uh, doesn't have a head. Now this is a a negative misrepresentation in that uh, it fails to. Uh, represent her head. It omits a representation of her head. Now, a positive misrepresentation, on the other hand, represents properties that aren't there. So where a negative misrepresentation fails to represent properties that are there, it misses out properties that are there, like the woman's head. A positive misrepresentation presents you with properties, or appears to present you with properties, uh, that aren't there. So here's an example. So the Mula Laya illusion here, the familiar um, uh, example of the uh, two lines which appear to be different lengths, the one with the inward pointing arrow heads appears to be longer. That's an example of a positive misrepresentation. The longer line positively looks longer. It's uh, the, the, it, 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 the image presents to you the, um, the uh, bottom line as, as longer. Um, and so the question for us is, does the introspect, how does the introspective model misrepresent uh, its targets? Does it misrepresent them negatively by missing out things that are in fact there, or positively by including things that aren't there, and specifically uh, the, the, the phenomenal qualities that aren't there? And uh, 
This uh, question is the topic of a recent paper by Francois Camara uh, called How Rich is the Illusion of Consciousness? He uh, characterizes the two um, kinds of uh, illusion as rich and sparse. The rich um, illusion is one that involves positive misrepresentation, that introspection positively represents our experiences as having phenomenal properties. Uh, sparse illusion, on the other hand, is one that involves in which introspection negatively misrepresents our experiences, misses out some properties that are there, and so leads us to, uh, in some way, to form the judgment that they have phenomenal properties, even though it doesn't positively represent them. It's a very interesting paper, and uh, I recommend it to you. And uh, just for amusement, here's a little video uh, uh, you can find on YouTube, A Headless Man this time. Uh, it's a very effective little illusion which makes... Um, uh, exploits the um, the eye's blind spot, and uh, uh, you experience the illusion of of, of a man uh, uh, losing his head. Um, let's just so let's let's look at these two options, negative and positive misrepresentation, in a, in a in a little more detail. So negative misrepresentation first. So the idea here is that. Intros uh, introspection does not positively represent experience as reddish. It doesn't positively represent uh, experience as, as a qualitative state. It merely doesn't represent it as a non-qualitative one. It doesn't represent it as a, a, a neural state, a brain state, or as a functional state of some kind. It doesn't represent it as a complex physical state. Uh, so it partially represents it. Uh, and then we infer that the experience is a qualitative state uh, because introspection doesn't, rep doesn't represent it as not being a qualitative state. Introspection, because introspection doesn't represent it as a, a, a physical, functional state of some kind with, a, with a, a structure to it, we infer that it's a purely qualitative state with no structure to it. And that's a, a bad inference. It's like the uh, the headless woman. We, uh, if you um, were to, if you were present at the sideshow and you you saw the, the woman sitting there like that, and you judge that she didn't have a head, that would be a bad inference. It would be you would be inferring from the fact that you couldn't see her head to the conclusion that she didn't have one. And that's that's a bad inference. However tempting um, the scene might make it. And so maybe this is what is happening in the case of introspection. Uh, our introspective model is providing us with a very limited, sketchy, partial information about our experiences, which doesn't present them as complex brain states. And we infer from that that they are, in fact, simple qualitative states. And uh, there's a, a nice suggestion here in a paper by Daniel Chabasson, which is that we posit res reddishness. Reddishness is a sort of explanatory um, posit that we make um, to, ex to justify our introspective judgments. The thought here is that when we introspect, we are inclined to make all these judgments about what our inner lives are like. But we don't have any access to the basis for those judgments. The introspective model, remember, is constructed at a subpersonal level. And it leads us to form these judgments, but we don't have any uh, understanding of the grounds for them. We just say, well, that's just what it's like introspectively. And this means that we, we can't justify these judgments. They just, uh, we're just disposed to make them and, and that's it. So, so if you ask me how I, how I know that my experience is like that, how I know that this experience is very different from, the, from another experience and rather more similar to, to another one, to a third one, um, I can't, I can't say. I'm just, uh, I'm at a loss. So it seems that I, I can't justify these judgments to you. Um, but at the same time, we're very convinced that these judgments are correct. Um, we feel more sure of these introspective judgments than we do of our judgments about the world around us. I feel um, more sure of the judgments I'm inclined to make about the, the uh, character of my experience than I am about uh, the world out there that's that's causing those experiences. So we're in a strange position of having these 
judgments that we can't justify, uh, but which we feel extremely uh, confident about, perhaps completely certain about. And this is this is a, an uncomfortable position, and and Shabbaton suggests that in order that we posit mental qualities, uh, qualia, in order to resolve this conflict, um, if introspection were actually presenting us directly, immediately with mental qualities, then though the existence of those mental qualities and our direct acquaintance with them would justify our judgments. Uh, so that resolves our problem. Um, we, hypothe we, we, we hypothesize the existence of these properties, not deliberately but intuitively, to, ex to explain our confidence in our judgments. But it's the judgments that come first. We're inclined to make these judgments. We feel extremely confident in them. We don't have any way of justifying them. So we, as it were, invent a justification for them in the form of internal mental properties uh, that are immediately presented to us. Uh, I've summarized that very briefly uh, there, and uh, there's a lot more detail in the paper. So again, I encourage you to, to check on that, uh, to, to follow that up. But that that's um, uh, an example of how a, a negative misrepresentation uh, account of uh, the introspective illusion might go. Now, this approach, I think, is quite attractive. Um, it has some advantages. Uh, it's economical. Um, it doesn't in, it's it doesn't involve uh, positing. Uh, introspective representation, uh, uh, subpersonal representations of phenomenal properties. And because of that, it also avoids the, the phenomenal representation problem. All we need to do now is explain the content of our personal level phenomenal concepts. We don't need to explain the content of subpersonal uh, representations of, phenomena, of phenomenal properties because there aren't any. Uh, and another attractive feature of it is that it explains why phenomenality is so elusive. Um, remember that qualia are often described as being ineffable. You can't really, you can't describe what they're like in themselves. Well, if this story is right, then uh, that's not at all, it's not surprising that qualia are elusive because there's no real content to the notion. And we're just, we're positing qualia as things that justify our judgments, our introspective judgments. But we don't give any positive content to, uh, to the notion. Uh, there's no positive representation of reddishness or whatever quality it might be involved. So there's no wonder they're elusive, no wonder we can't describe them because there's nothing really, there's no content even to our representations of uh, of qualia. It's not just that there aren't any qualia, but we're not even representing them in a substantial, in a positive way. And so this is a this is quite a tempting approach. Um, here's a little quotation from, quotation from Daniel Dennett, um, which um, uh, I read as endorsing a, a negative misrepresentation uh, view. Here, Dennett says, we have a, a limited, biased access to the workings of our of our brains, this is the uh, the introspective model, which we involuntarily misinterpret. This is now getting to the to the um, to the to the uh, uh, it, per, the inference to the personal level judgment, uh, which we involuntarily misinterpret as a rendering, uh, spread on the, uh, a sort of painting, spread on the external world or on a private screen or stage of both the world's external properties, colours, aromas, sounds, and many of our own internal responses, expectations satisfied, desires identified, and so on. So here, uh, uh, then it is suggesting, I think, a, a negative misrepresentation view. We just have this limited, biased access that is at the same time shaped by uh, a sensitivity to our own reactions. So this is combining a negative misrepresentation view with uh, uh, the view that the target of, um, of, uh, or at least one of the targets of introspection, uh, uh, is our own uh, reactions, our responses. So 
this is quite an attractive view. Um, but there are also some problems for it. One of them is highlighted by a camera in his in the paper I mentioned. Um, he he asks this: if all that's involved is negative misrepresentation, why do we find uh, illusionism so so counterintuitive? Why are people so resistant to the idea uh, that phenomenality that what we what, when we talk about uh, the, the phenomenal feel of experience? We're really just talking about physical features of the brain. And when somebody, uh, in cases of negative misrepresentation, we may initially have the impression that uh, something's the case, like we have the, may initially have the impression that the, the woman is has no head. But once it's explained to you that she is in fact wearing a, um, a, a contraption of mirrors, you uh, you no longer form that you know, you're no longer inclined to form that belief once it's explained to you that the representation is missing something out then you're okay you 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 uh, update your beliefs so why when neuroscientists come along say and give you an account of what's happening in your visual cortex um that doesn't mention anything like quietly and says really that's all that's going on these extremely complex patterns of neuron firing and so on why do we still feel inclined to say that, no, I really am acquainted with this, this in mental quality, this, this reddishness, this, this, this you know, mental qualities, qualia, the reddishness of seeing the red apple. It's, it all seems too vivid and real and immediate to be explained merely as a negative misrepresentation, uh, that really all that's happening is introspection isn't giving us the full picture of the complex neural processes involved, and that we, we're just positing these, we're just uh, mistakenly inferring the existence of these uh, mental qualities from that. That, that seems too... Um, uh, it, it, seems, it, seems like, it seems like a, an inadequate explanation. And uh, at any rate, the, an illusionist who takes this negative misrepresentation line is going to have to uh, explain why we feel this resistance, why we... Um, why we don't, why we're not willing um, to uh, cease to make this bad inference from limited introspection to a positive judgment that our experiences possess uh, phenomenal uh, qualities, phenomenal properties. Um, okay, so that's negative misrepresentation. Positive misrepresentation, of course, is is the view that um, now, the, the, the introspective model uh, does positively represent the experience as being reddish. Because it's not reddish. It doesn't, there aren't, according to the illusionist, there aren't any phenomenal properties. But the, somehow the introspective model positively represents it as being reddish. Um, and then this misrepresentation then generates the, the, uh, the personal level judgment that the experience is reddish. And in this case, of course, that inference isn't a, a bad one if the introspective model is, is, is representing uh, the experience of positively representing the experience as reddish, then uh, it's reasonable on, on that basis to form the judgment that the experience is reddish. So here we might say that the, the misrepresentation is deeper. Uh, the illusion is deeper. It's at the subpersonal level, at the level of the introspective model, whereas on a negative misrepresentation view, the illusion is more superficial. It lies in our interpretation of the introspective model, in the, our judgments are based on what introspection is telling us. So we might say that on the negative misrepresentation model, introspection isn't lying to us. It's just uh, giving us a very incomplete story, which we then misinterpret. Uh, uh, on the positive misrepresentation story, introspection is actually lying to us. It's actually telling us that there's reddishness there, and uh, we're just trusting it. Uh, so the, in, in this case, the misrepresentation both generates and justifies the judgment that, infra, that um, experience is reddish. And so on this story, we're going to need representations of reddishness at both the personal level, we're going to need a phenomenal concept, of course, and we're also going to need subpersonal representations of reddishness, positive representations of phenomenality at the subpersonal level. And now, of course, the phenomenal representation problem really comes back um, uh, to bite us. Uh, how is reddishness represented at the subpersonal level? Okay, so the, the phenomenal representation problem um, uh, uh, is particularly 
uh, pressing for illusionists to take the positive misrepresentation line. I think to, ad to address this problem, though, um, uh, we'd have to get into a much wider debate about the nature of mental representation. There are many different theories here, and some very complex issues. And it, it may be that uh, a theory of mental content is going to have to allow for this kind of systematic uh, positive misrepresentation for the uh, representation of properties that are, that are never actually present. And so if so, there will be no special problem for illusionism here. But at any rate, it's, it's addressing this problem is going to involve getting into, into much, uh, much uh, wider debates. OK, let's move on to another question now. Is the illusion cognitively penetrable? Uh, let, me, uh, let me explain what that means. Uh, to say that an illusion is cognitive, cognitively penetrable is to say that you can, you can make it go away, you can dispel it by, by um, getting more information about, about what it is that you're, that, you're, um, that you're seeing, if it's a visual illusion. Uh, uh, think about it like this. Uh, 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 an illusion is an interpretation of uh, the, the, the stimuli you're, um, you're um, receiving. Uh, you're interpreting the stimuli as, as an indication of the, the existence of some state of affairs that, that, that isn't actual. And the interpretations, uh, uh, these interp the, the interpretation you make is going to depend on assumptions about the relation between stimuli and uh, the things that are causing them. And so the question is, can these assumptions be updated, be um, uh, be overridden by by, by more accurate uh, information? Uh, in the case of the the headless woman illusion, that 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 is cognitively penetrable. Once you, uh, if you're if it's explained to you that uh, what you're looking at here is a woman wearing uh, some wearing mirrors on her head that uh, make it look as if that make it look as if she she doesn't have a head, then you're not going to be subject to the illusion anymore. You're going to um, you're going to reinterpret what you're seeing and uh, cease to um, cease to be surprised. Uh, the uh, Muller liar illusion, on the other hand, that's the with, with the two lines with the arrowheads pointing in different directions. That illusion is 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 not cognitively penetrable. Even if you know, even if you're told that the two lines are of exactly the same length, and even if you measure them yourself and make absolutely uh, convince yourself uh, uh, completely that they are the same length, they're still going to look at different lengths. The the one with the inward pointing arrowheads is still going to look longer, and that's because the the assumptions there that, that, that generate the illusion are, are, are built into your visual processing system. Your, your, um, your visual system employs certain uh, uh, basic assumptions about uh, the way the world is structured uh, in interpreting uh, the uh, uh, signals from your, from your eyes. And these, uh, 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 these assumptions can't be overridden by new beliefs that you form. They're, they're buried too deep, if you like. Uh, and many optical illusions are like that. They exploit features of the way that um, that your um, your brain processes visual information. Uh, so the question for us here is: To what extent is the illusion of phenomenality uh, cognitively penetrable? Can, can can you make it go away by 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 learning more uh, about what's actually happening? Um, well. Uh, Notice that, that there's, there's a possibility of penetrability at two levels. There are going to be two levels at which new information might affect what's uh, uh, affect the illusion. The illusion involves two levels of representation, as we saw, the uh, representation of experience by the introspective model, and then the judgments that we form on the basis of that introspective model. Uh, so uh, the, there are two possibilities of how new information might uh, dispel the illusion. It might... Uh, uh, interfere with the it might uh, correct the way that the introspective model models experience or it might uh, or it might uh, help us not to make the uh, judgments uh, the introspective judgments that we make on the basis of the introspective model so there are two places then where new information might might uh, help to dispel the the illusion at, 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 at this higher level um, where we form judgments based on the introspective model, and at this lower level where introspection models experience. 
so I guess it's it's more likely that there could be penetrability at the higher level where um, where we form judgments based on uh, on introspection. Uh, it seems it seems not uh, not implausible that these judgments could be affected by other judgments that we make, other beliefs that we have. Um, whereas the introspective model itself and the way that it represents experience, that perhaps is harder to uh, to influence. It's it's at a, a deeper level, if you like. It's more comparable to the to the way that uh, the uh, the visual system processes um, uh, uh, information. But still, it's 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 a possibility. Perhaps with certain kinds of training and certain kinds of meditation, we can affect the introspective model itself. Who knows? And uh, and the question here, of, of course, is is related to the to the earlier question about the nature of the misrepresentation involved, whether it's negative or positive. If the introspective model only negatively uh, misrepresents experience, then it should be easier to um, to uh, withhold the inference uh, to the judgment that uh, our experiences have phenomenal properties. Uh, after all, we, we don't have to actually override anything that introspection is telling us. We just have to, to uh, interpret the limited information that it's given us in the light of wider information that we have. So the, if, if uh, the, the introspective model only negatively misrepresents experience, then the possibility, then the illusion should be penetrable at, at the higher level, um, uh, or at least it seems likely that it should be. If the introspective model positively misrepresents uh, uh, experience, then uh, I guess it's going to be less likely that um, we can uh, we can suspend that judgment, or it's going to be harder to then uh, it's going to be harder to suspend that judgment. So there are lots of uh, uh, of interesting uh, issues here. And this is an area that's ripe for experimental investigation, for finding out uh, whether people can conceptualize their mental lives differently. Uh, people who uh, know a lot more about meditation and Buddhist philosophy than I do tell me that there are ways of breaking down these uh, these introspective illusions. So there are lots of interesting uh, uh, paths to explore here. Okay, cognitive, that's cognitive penetrability. Uh, Another question, is the illusion internal or external? Uh, what I mean by this is, where exactly are phenomenal properties represented as being located? As illusionists, of course, we deny that phenomenal properties are actually located anywhere, but where are they uh, represented as being located? When we introspect, where do the phenomenal properties seem to be? Okay, And three possibilities. One, internally. So here the idea is that introspection represents reddishness as a property of experience itself. Um, so when we introspect uh, and attend to our experience, it seems that the experience itself, the mental state, has uh, this quality to it. The reddishness actually seems to belong to our mind. And that's, a, that's many philosophers have, have taken that view. Um, it's perhaps not as popular now as it, it once was, but it's certainly a, uh, uh, a very influential view. It seems to me, uh, uh, it doesn't seem to reflect my own experience. When I look at an apple and I focus on the, the quality of redness that, that seems to be there, uh, it seems to be up there in the apple, uh, not in here in my mind. Uh, of course, science tells us that there aren't really any qualitative properties like that out there in the world. Science doesn't detect these qualities, it just detects uh, surface features that reflect light of certain wavelengths. Really what's happening is that light is, uh, electromagnetic radiation is hitting the apple and certain wavelengths are being absorbed and certain are being reflected and uh, the reflected ones are hitting the retina and so on. Um, science doesn't mention this, this, this quality of redness. <laughs> Um, but nevertheless, it, it seems to be out there to me. So in the light of that, one thing that, that uh, people sometimes suggest is that, well, these qualities are properties of our, of our experience, the, the mental properties, but somehow our minds project them outwards uh, onto, the, onto the world around us and as it were, paint the, the, the external world with, with, uh, with these mental qualities. So we, as it were, uh, are 
and, uh, as it were, illuminating the world, or uh, uh, decorating the world with our mental, um, uh, with the mental, with the qualities that our minds are creating. It's quite a, quite a poetic picture, um, but I don't think that. So here's the this suggestion, but I don't think that works from an illusionist perspective. Maybe if you're a realist, you can say something like that. These these properties are really located in our minds, but somehow we uh, we misrepresent them as being uh, projected as being uh, in in the uh, in in the world around us. Uh, but that that only works if they are real properties. You can only misrepresent the location of a property if it actually has a location. Okay, so we can only misrepresent mental properties as being uh, out there in the world if they're actually uh, in here and in our minds. Uh, if we we take an illusionist view, if we say, well, no, these these properties only exist as objects of our uh, as intentional objects of our representations then they are wherever we represent them as being. It's like saying, uh, <laughs> take Sherlock Holmes again. If Conan Doyle uh, tells you that Sherlock Holmes uh, is in his rooms in Baker Street, then that's where he is. He, uh, Conan Doyle couldn't be misrepresenting his location. It couldn't be that Sherlock Holmes was actually somewhere else and uh, Conan Doyle was somehow projecting him into his rooms. Uh, he is wherever Colonel Doyle Kernan Doyle describes him as being, and similarly, phenomenal properties, if they're not real, if they're, if they're merely the intentional objects of our representations, then they are wherever uh, uh, we represent them as being. An illusory property cannot be projected like that. Okay, so, so uh, a third option then, which I'm inclined to favour, is that introspection represents these qualities as being out there in the world. Uh, so it represents the reddishness as out there painted on the surface of the apple. Um, so you may wonder then, well, what has introspection got to do with it? Why isn't it just perception? I mean, we're looking at the apple. Why isn't it perception that's doing this? Rather, how does why mention introspection at all here? Well, the idea is this: that it's introspection is monitoring our our experiences. So introspection is sensitive to features of our experience. Um, and uh, we discussed earlier which features these might be, the, the perceptual side, the reactive side, mechanisms of attention and so on. So that's what, introspe that's what in introspection is actually monitoring and modelling. But it uses information about these features of experience to construct a model of the objects of the experiences. So let's suppose that what introspection is modelling is our reactions, uh, the reactions that are, are being produced by what it is that we're seeing, a red, a red apples. So let's say that uh, introspection is monitoring these reactions and constructing a schematic representation of the pattern of reactions that's been generated. But then it's representing that impact as a feature of the apple itself. So it's representing the apple as something that's having this impact on us. So it, think of it like uh, something like beauty, say. Uh, is is the beauty in the in the uh, you're looking at a beautiful sunset? Is the beauty in the sunset, or is it in us? Well, the beauty is a measure of the impact that the scene is having on us, but we represent it as a feature of the sunset itself. We think of the sunset as being beautiful. And what we're saying about the sunset there is that it's having a certain effect on us. Now, the suggestion here is that that's what introspection is doing with uh, these qualities. It's monitoring features of our experience, say our reactions, but then representing those features as belonging to the object that we're experiencing. So it's representing the impact of the object as a feature of the object itself. It's representing the object as being potent, if you like, as, uh, as something that is actively affecting us. So I think that's a, a promising way of, of, of looking at it. But again, note that the answer to this question is going to be related to, uh, to the answers to, to the, some of the other questions we asked. There I, um, uh, I uh, linked this uh, uh, external representation uh, view with, uh, the, uh, with the view that what introspection is targeting is our, our reactions. I think those two go quite nicely together. Um, there are going to be all sorts of connections between the answers to these different questions. So that's a, a, a possible um, 
a possible uh, view here. Okay, but then you might ask, well, if that's what's happening, why why did people ever think that these qualities were properties of our of our of our experiences? Um, if the introspective model is representing them as external, wh why did an anyone ever come to think that they were internal? Um, why, uh, why, why are we tempted to judge that it's our experiences uh, that, that, uh, that, that have these uh, um, qualities? Well, one plausible answer to that, I think, is that it's, 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 it's by process of inference. Uh, initially, originally, people did think that these qualities were out there in the world. The, 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 the reddishness was, was a property of the apple and so on. But then science came along and told us that, well, no, it's not really like that. Uh, uh, these qualities don't figure in our scientific picture of the world. Uh, what we see there, again, are light waves bouncing off surfaces and so on, and uh, uh, sound uh, pressure waves in the air and molecules in the, in the air that um, produce smells and so on. Uh, the world isn't filled with these qualities. So the apple isn't really reddish. It doesn't have this quality of red. It just has a certain surface texture that reflects uh, 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 certain kinds of uh, certain wavelengths of light. Um, so science tells us that the apple isn't really reddish. But then we, we think, well, but something's reddish. I'm definitely aware of this reddishness. It's that's real. It's there. It's you know, <laughs> nothing could be more sure, right? Um, so, if the apple isn't really reddish, but something is reddish, then the reddishness must be a property of our experience of the apple. If it's not out, if the reddishness isn't out there, it must be in here. So we arrive at the judgment that our experience is reddish. Uh, by way of a bunch of mediating beliefs, uh, including scientific um, uh, uh, theories about um, the nature of, of perception and, uh, and so on. Right, so there's another, if you like, another dimension uh, to illusionist theory, um, um, uh, another choice point for illusionist theorists, how they're going to think about the the, uh, locate, the represented location of phenomenal properties. Okay. Um, here's another question uh, which uh, we'll just look at uh, briefly. When does the illusion occur? We tend to think that we are continually phenomenally conscious, uh, at least while, while we're awake. That our experiences always have this 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 rich uh, quality to them. That there's always something it's like uh, for for us to be experiencing the world. Even when we're not paying attention to our experience, we we tend to think of it as, as still having this this this, this quality to it. Um, uh, it's not that it switches off when we're not paying attention to it. It's it's still there. Um, so what does the illusionist say about this? Of course, the illusionist says that it isn't really there at all. <laughs> there isn't really this inner world of qualities. But still we have the sense that there is. So why do we have that sense? Is it because introspective monitoring is always occurring, that the introspective, uh, that the introspective processes are continually modelling uh, aspects of our experience and continually constructing this model? And it's the information from that model is always there for us um, uh, whenever we choose to, to, uh, to attend to it. Or is it just because whenever we ask ourselves what our experience is like, whenever we think about it, uh, the introspective mon monitoring kicks in and generates a judgment? So our, on one view, introspective monitoring is going on all the time. On the other, it's just, it's just idling and waiting until we think about, what our, about our experience and ask ourselves what our experience is like. Uh, and then the in introspective model... Uh, uh, then introspection quickly constructs a model and, and, and provides an answer. We might compare this to a, to a fridge light. Uh, is the, fr the light inside the fridge always on, like the continual monitoring, or does it only come on when we open the door? Does the monitoring only start when we ask ourselves uh, 
what we're experiencing. Um, well, introspectively, we won't be able to tell because uh, all we know is that whenever we whenever we think about it, we uh, whenever we think about what our experience is like, we get an answer. So this isn't a question we can settle by introspection. It's it's a question for a for a theory for a theory of of introspection, uh, and for a, for an illusionist theory of consciousness. And it may be that there's that uh, the answer is not a clear cut one either way. There may be uh, uh, intermediate positions, different levels of monitoring, perhaps different types of monitoring, introspective monitoring. Well, we're we're coming to the end now, but I, I want to close with with another question, um, or rather, a, a a bunch of related questions about uh, how the illusion uh, arose and what its function is, if it has one. Uh, although I'm dealing with these at the end, and I'm not going to say a lot about them, they're, they're important questions. But I think they they I think the answers to them will depend on. Uh, answers to some of the other questions on the shape of the, the theory we come up with. Um, uh, so uh, let me just mention these. Uh, uh, I've been talking a lot about in mechanisms of introspective monitoring and the role they play in generating the illusion of phenomenal consciousness. But um, these mechanisms themselves, uh, uh, when did they evolve? I'm assuming they are, they are brain systems that uh, uh, all humans possess. Uh, but um, when did these mechanisms evolve, and, and why did they evolve? What what functions do they perform? Why did evolution select for them? Uh, are these mechanisms unique to humans? Do, do, do other animals have them? Uh, and and what what functions do they serve? I suggested in earlier lectures that uh, introspection gives us a, a, a new. Uh, level of self-control if um, it makes us uh, by having information about our own experiences by being able to recognize our experiences and remember them uh, we can uh, adopt attitudes to our own experiences we can uh, deliberately seek out uh, experiences that we like uh, we can cultivate experiences that we like we, we can uh, share information about them with other people and withhold information about them. It gives us a, 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 a new level of reflective control uh, of ourselves. Uh, but what about the, the illusion? Uh, if, if, I, if the illusionists are right, this introspective monitoring also uh, produces produce this illusion of phenomenality. Was that merely a side effect of introspection. So introspection was selected for, uh, for these uh, functions of self-control and then it just happened that that produced uh, this as a side effect, this uh, uh, illusion of phenomenality. Or was that, is that illusion actually also one of, the, one of the functions of introspection? Did evolution actually select for mechanisms that would, that would foster that illusion? Um, Remember, I mentioned uh, Nicholas Humphrey's uh, ideas about sentition uh, uh, earlier. He, he, he thinks that um, that uh, 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 evolution uh, did uh, uh, shape the mechanisms of sentition and uh, introspection precisely to create this, this this illusion, because the illusion has all sorts of uh, uh, um, adaptive, ben uh, all sorts of benefits for uh, uh, for us. It enriches our lives in all sorts of ways. So there's one question about the illusion. Is it, um, is it itself an adaptation or just a side effect? Here's, here's another question. Uh, what, role, what role does culture play in generating the illusion? Uh, uh, the introspective, introspective mechanisms themselves uh, operate at a subpersonal level. Perhaps culture doesn't have much effect on those. But the judgments that we form in the light of introspection, how we interpret the information that our introspective model supplies us with, uh, culture could shape that. Um, and it may be that people from different cultures have conceptualized their, 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 their inner lives differently. And of course, this links to the question about cognitive penetrability. Maybe, maybe culture can um, uh, shape uh, the way that we... If, if, 
culture can shape the way we conceptualize our own lives, the way we interpret um, what introspection tells us, then, uh, then this means that, to that extent, the illusion is cognitively penetrable. Okay, so the the role of culture that's 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 one issue. Uh, a related uh, question is about the role of language. What role does language play in in creating the the illusion of phenomenality? Uh, I suggested uh, I've suggested that one of the functions of introspection is to to enable us to communicate about our our experiences, that is to share information about our experiences with others. And if that's right, then it, uh, there's going to be quite a tight connection between language and introspection and therefore between language and uh, the, the, uh, the, the illusion of phenomenality, this sense we have of having a private inner life. And uh, this is a central theme in uh, Daniel Dennett's work on consciousness, uh, developed, for example, in his 1991 book, uh, Consciousness Explained. Um, it's a complicated story, and I won't try to go into it uh, uh, here, but the general idea is that our conscious minds are, to a large extent, uh, the product of linguistic activity, of our, of our talking to ourselves. Um, when we talk to ourselves, uh, we, we, we question ourselves, we, we prompt ourselves, we, we ask ourselves what our experience is like. Um, what, am I, what, is, what is this? What, do I, what am I feeling? What am I, how, does, how does that look to me? Does that look good? Is that, am I happy with this? Does that feel right? And so on. We, we ask ourselves these questions. And um, our brain systems produce responses, um, just as, as they would produce responses to questions from other people. And this generates a stream of question and response, which helps to fix uh, contents of experience. Remember that his, um, the Dennett's story about the multiple drafts of experience? That there isn't one uh, of, uh, definitive stream of experience. The, um, the brain is constructing multiple different versions, multiple different interpretations of what's happening. And it's only when we probe ourselves that particular contents get uh, get brought to the surface, as it were, and articulated, and enter into this stream of question and response. And uh, so the idea here is that is that language is playing a central role in in fixing the contents of our conscious ex of our conscious experience. Um, uh, it's the channel as it were by which we interrogate the introspective model that's that's um at least that's one way of putting it i'm not sure whether then it would would um uh, would agree with that way of putting it um and here's a little uh, illustration here's a little image from um Dennett's 1991 book which illustrates um uh one of the ideas here that um you remember that Dennett uh compares consciousness to fame to informational fame well one way uh, bits of information can get to be famous is by uh, being articulated in speech and then heard. So if if, uh, if I'm uh, if if I'm uh, uh, if I'm looking for the answer to something to some to some question and there's a bit of relevant information stored somewhere in my brain but it's kind of buried away in some subsystem. Maybe if I if I ask myself the question, then that bit of information will get uh, will will will, will uh, trigger a response that I will then articulate and I will say oh well, you know if I ask myself where are my keys where are my keys a little bit of information that um about the, my having left them in the in the uh, in the car say uh might get articulated and I say oh car and then hearing that hearing that and uh, uh when I then hear myself say that uh my auditory system processes the information and then sends it on to other brain systems and now that bit of information gets to be to be famous uh, because it's got to be articulated in language. Language makes it famous. And similarly with bits of information about our own experiences, by probing the introspective model and then articulating the results, those bits of information about our own experiences get to be uh, uh, neurally famous. Okay, so it's a, it's, the idea is that the, um, the linguistic system acts as a kind of um, uh, uh, way of amplifying the, uh, uh, the neural importance of bits of information. Uh, and, and thereby uh, creating a, uh, uh, what we call the conscious mind. Okay, that's, that's very brief and sketchy, but uh, uh, I hope that's enough to give you a flavour of it. Do um, do uh, uh, read the full treatment. It's, it's I think a very very important um, uh, a very important book indeed. Okay, so uh, uh, there are many more questions here, uh, related questions there. Um, 
uh, how how widespread is the illusion among humans if it is culture if culture does play a role in generating it uh, to what extent is it is it is it uh, universal among humans maybe uh, or um, both uh, today and uh, in past societies um, have people always uh, 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 con conceived of their of their mental lives in this way as as private inner worlds of mental qualities. Um, it is the illusion a beneficial one? I, I, I mentioned the idea that um, that uh, Nicholas Humphrey's idea that that um, uh, the, the illusion is, is is an adaptive one, and that natural selection actually selected for for mechanisms that that um, that generate it. Um, and uh, but uh, e even if that's not so, it uh, even if the illusion is a is a cultural um, a, a, a cultural product, if it's more like a, a, a meme and an idea, um, uh, a way of a way of, um, of thinking, a way of conceptualizing one's one's own uh, mental life um, that is culturally transmitted. And we can we can still ask the same question: Is is it beneficial, or or is it or is it a, a, a harmful meme that we should try to um, that we should try to uh, get rid of? And there are many more questions here. Uh, um, uh, I'm sure you can uh, you can think of many more for yourself. Okay, so uh, okay, so we we we've come to the end now. Um, um, those are just a, a few of the questions, a few of the different um, uh, options for the illusionist, different different um, uh, questions that illusionist theorists are going to have to address. And each one of them, of course, will uh, offers a different choice point in the development of of a detailed illusionist theory, and there are many more questions that um, that illusionists are going to have to address. Um, the space of possible theories is is I think going to be the space of possible illusionist theories is going to be uh, uh, very large and uh, and quite complex. Uh, and I don't think the answers to any of these questions are going to be. Uh, neat and independent, although I've presented a lot of separate questions, uh, as if each one could be answered in isolation. I don't think that's the case. I think um, uh, each one um, uh, will, uh, the, the answer we give to each one will, will be influenced by the answers we give to other ones, and so it's going to be a, a much more holistic process of theory formation. Um, and here's a nice uh, little uh, caution about that uh, from Dennett. Um, He's commenting on a, on a on a paper that I that I wrote on this where I raised some of the some questions like this and he says Frankish's questions are are good questions but that doesn't mean that they will all have crisp answers and I think that's a that's an important um, qualification to bear in mind. Uh, I don't think these the, any of these questions should be treated in isolation from any of the, from any of the others nor that we should assume that in each even if I've presented two or three different possible answers that that means that all the answers must fall neatly into one of those categories. Um, uh, it's it's going to be much more uh, much more complicated than that, I think. Uh, and uh, importantly, th th this isn't um, uh, answering these questions and developing illusionist theories isn't going to be a matter just for philosophers at all. Uh, it's going to require interdisciplinary theorizing the way we um, evaluate these options and. Uh, start to see how things hang together is going to be influenced, must be influenced by uh, uh, work uh, across the cognitive sciences. Um, uh, it must be uh, solidly grounded in, 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 uh, in empirical work, I think. Okay, so that's all for this time. Uh, next time in the in the final lecture, we're going to look at some of the implications of illusionism. So, so suppose we we accept illusionism, we accept that that's the way to go forward with a theory of consciousness, and that's how we should start thinking of consciousness. Uh, what implications uh, would that have for thinking about perhaps uh, ethical issues, for thinking about uh, the consciousness of non-human animals, um, for for machine for the creation of artificial consciousness, and so on. Uh, well, does illusionism require a revolution in the way we think about these things, um, or are its implications more more modest? So we'll look at some of those questions next time, but uh, for now, thank you for listening, and uh, I'll see you next week. <laughs>